Welcome to series two of my podcast stories of unconscious bias. I'm Smitha Tharoor. In series one, I had the great privilege of hearing stories of unconscious bias from some wonderful people about a wide range of topics. I laughed, cried and was moved in equal measure. I started this series because I wanted the listeners to realize that we are not alone. All of us have similar stories. They may not be the exact same, but when we hear them, we can hear the parallels in our lives. My speakers have all shared their learning and how they manage their unconscious biases, which is also a wonderful life lesson for us. Series two will follow the same style of interview. I hope you enjoy listening. Welcome listeners. I'd like to introduce Suveer Saran. Suveer is a New Delhi-based culinary authority. He's the author of three celebrated books, chef and owner of THC, The House of Celeste, a modern Indian restaurant in Gurgaon near Delhi. I've had the pleasure of eating an absolutely scrumptious dinner there pre-lockdown days. Suvi's approachable style has helped demystify Indian cuisine and has earned him the first Michelin star awarded to an Indian restaurant in America. Speaking, teaching and appearing at thought leadership retreats worldwide Suveer has used food as a bridge to bring disparate groups and people together. He has a new book, Instamatic, where he shares with us the inspiration behind his art and his journeys across multiple civilizations, from the land of his birth to the land of karma, which I'm sure you will find very intriguing. So, with no further ado, I'd like to say, Suveer, I want to know more about these journeys that you've made. Welcome. And thank you so much for joining me in this conversation to talk about stories of unconscious bias. Thank you for having me, Smitha. So, Suvi, straight up, unconscious bias, that's what what we're talking about. And you talk about journeys across multiple civilizations and so on. So what do you even understand by these two words, unconscious bias? Uh, The challenges of the conscious mind and the subconscious leanings that Uh, alter the uh, course of our lives if we allow our unconscious biases to take over our lives and not be guided by the opportunities that life is sending our way. And I've realized through um, the good and bad uh, uh, opportunities that came my way, and as I gleaned over them and I reflected on them, I realized what were opportunities I missed because of unconscious biases and which were the ones that I captured because I didn't allow unconscious bias to rob me of those opportunities. Oh, that's wonderful, because you've, you've already started, not only are you explaining to me about how, how you, you have had and may still have unconscious biases, but on reflection, you recognize where, where you could have, uh, you know, achieved something wonderful and, and you didn't allow yourself. Tell us more, Sovir. I mean, that, that sounds um, very intriguing. Where, what was this opportunity where perhaps because of your unconscious bias, you lost an opportunity? Is that what you meant? You know, when I was 18 and I went to Bombay, which is now Mumbai, to study at Sir J.J. School of Art, they, it's the school where Rajat Kipling's father was a dean and it had, uh, people think of it as being one of the greatest art schools and I thought of it as being uh, almost the opposite and that's the reason I never, I left the art world and went into food. When I arrived there, my classmates were all 99.9% Maharashtrian. And for them, this kid who was very light skinned, when I'm clean shaven, I look very fair. And for them, I was a Punjabi, a Kashmiri. Uh, They would ask me, what are you? And I would say, what do you mean, what am I? I'm human. And for them, it wasn't a good enough answer. They wanted to know what caste, creed, race I was. And I was different from them. So I was already a foreigner in my own land. And with that little uh, uh, difference between us, I felt uncomfortable, they felt threatened, and the uh, brilliance of an art education was robbed of me. And I also judged these people harshly because of their unconscious bias and uh, my own. And I think it was an unfortunate uh, uh, situation at a very early stage in my life. I was all of 18, they were all of 18. And so I think it colored my impression of Sir J.J. School of Art and it uh, robbed me of a good art education. I then went to New York and studied at the School of Visual Arts where my unconscious bias, which was 
so uh, uh, by then conditioned to feeling as the other. I thought I was the only gay man in art school in New York City. My classmates now laugh when I tell them I thought I was the only gay student. And like when 90% of the class may have been gay, I just pretended I was the misnomer, I was the outsider, I was the foreigner, I was the exotic one, all of those things. And I, so my entire art education in India and New York was ruined by that bias of me thinking I'm the other because of the other being these students in Bombay treating me like the outsider. My mind then allowed myself to believe I was an outsider even in New York City in sexuality. So, you know, we, uh, uh, as I go back and I think if I'd been smarter, maybe if somebody had told me that, you know, it's just a passing phase, maybe I would have invested more in art school. Who knows? Well, I find that absolutely fascinating because there are many things that you've just said that I, I want to kind of summarize and, and learn for myself and for the listeners and, 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 to, and to see how you respond to that. One, of course, is, is for those of us who are listening and who are not of Indian origin, uh, would be surprised to understand uh, the phrase, which I'm paraphrasing, that you felt you were seen as a foreigner in your own country. So here you are, born and brought up in, I'm assuming, Delhi at the time, and then you go to Bombay to study, because it so happens that you are the color. We're all brown skinned in India, but there are shades of brown, and you are light skinned. And then you arrive in Bombay, and the majority of the students have a darker shade of skin. There is colorism from their perspective. And as you know, Savir, colorism is still happening in India today. And you were 19 years old, which is, of course, now a few years ago. But then there's another very important aspect which you've added, which is about your unconscious biases. So one is about colorism and how India then and today, sadly, still have unconscious biases when they look at their fellow Indian and make a snap judgment purely based on the color of their skin, which is extremely powerful. But then the next one is what you then did, and, and uh, forgive me for putting words in your mouth because these weren't your choice of words, but your experience at university in Bombay was, was, um, was traumatic, was difficult. Um, you felt very much an outsider. And so what you were doing were, was what, what these, these, um, you were throwing it into what I call metaphorically your backpack. You wanted to keep safe. You did Indeed. not want any more people to to be you know, rude to you, to, to ignore you, to, 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 to not have you as part of the group. So you went with this heavy backpack on your back to New York. And of course, there was another aspect of your identity, which is the fact that you're gay. So you arrive in New York, uh, 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 joining an art school there with this heavy backpack and not able to see the world that is offered to you because of what you have thrown into your backpack. I mean, Fabulous. I mean, I, I mean, fabulous as in for our own learning, fabulous. But from obviously from your perspective, it would have been a, a, an extremely difficult traumatic time. So how, how did you come to this realization? So t tell us more. I mean, this is this is wonderful. I t I, you know, the realization is long and hard. I'm still realizing it, Smita. I've been colored for life. I've been cast aside for life. So more metaphors for you to chew on. But I think um, I... I truly began to believe I'm the other. And I always hid myself into corners, into self-effacing ways, because I just didn't want to be singled out anymore. And in doing so, I often lost out on, you know, people thought I was prudish. Uh, my classmates who were gay said they thought I wasn't gay. They thought I was homophobic because I was so uh, boxed into this corner of my own making. And, you know, it's, it's so you damage your own self when you're not aware of how uh, other people's damaged views of their own lives and the lives of others can uh, damage the person who they also were trying to hurt. And, you know, even as you move past them, you continue to damage your own self. And I think I'm still learning to deal with it. It's a daily learning. It's a daily, uh, uh, you know, a, a therapy session I have to give myself that I'm not the other. It's okay. I can't play victim all my life. I have to grow up. I have to accept and I have to just ensure that uh, as I live today and tomorrow, I won't make the same mistakes again and again. But that's hard. That's much easier said than done, isn't it, Savir? Because... I mean, I, I have had the privilege of, of hearing stories from some some very difficult stories, like just your story as well, where because of the experiences that you have suffered 
at the hands of other people's biases, you you find it hard to come out of those experiences uh, without it protecting you and influencing you. And you use the word damage, but equally, of course, the reasons you you were you were you were throwing it into your backpack was to keep you safe. That was your gut instinct. That was your unconscious bias that I want to keep safe. But sadly, by wanting to keep safe, you present it to the outside world, perhaps your your fellow students at New York or, or even other, where, uh, other places, that, that, that you were maybe standoffish, that perhaps you were homophobic, and that was the last thing you, you wanted to present. But it's hard. And, and I think it's admirable that you are able to reflect and think about this on a daily basis. Of course, all of us who are listening will think of our own stories. It doesn't have to be about colorism or about sexuality. We all have you know, good, bad, and ugly in our lives. What do we, what happens when we look back on our personal negative experiences and do we then choose to put that particular experience and all other things connected to it into a box and put the lock on it and throw the key away and then have nothing else to do with that kind of environment? And you, on the other hand, have opened your arms and, and are seeking and learning all the time, which I think is fabulous. But share some more stories. So you're in New York now, and you, and and now what? Tell me more. So you know the one thing, Smita, that I did with that experience that we've just uh, tried to lock or free. Um, I now, when I see somebody sitting in a corner in a setting where they belong, and yet they are uh, standoffish and being a loner, <clears throat> and yet being aware that they're watching you without really wanting you to watch, know that they're watching you. I will go out and I'll poke and I'll needle them and I'll get them out. And I often realize there were people like me who have experiences that make them shy, that have made them a little nervous and have made them a little um, uncomfortable to join the crowd. And I've made it my mission to go seek those others and pull them out, sometimes to get almost to get a punch in my face for doing so, but most times very successfully realizing that, the, yes, they were versions of me. And when you talk to them and you invest in them and you bring them out, they come out and they realize the entire world is not judging them. Oh, that's and, wonderful. Uh, so it's a positive for me that I feel I've done something better with my life and I've also helped somebody else get one more step further with theirs. Absolutely. But as I then started cooking Smita, um, uh, I got. I was the first Indian chef to get a Michelin star. This was 2004, I believe, that I got it when New York first got the Michelin Guide. And it was, uh, 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 I guess, an accomplishment because we were a pool of 27 or so chefs that got it. And I was the only uh, Indian and the one of the two non-Northern European chefs to get it. Um, I didn't pay too much attention to that, but I I felt I'd been uh, at least made it to the uh, club of chefs that are considered uh, accomplished enough to uh, be heard, be watched, be uh, whose food people should taste. And so I kept working harder. And then in 2017, 2018, I opened a restaurant called Tapestry in New York City. And I tried, I opened a restaurant that served foods from 17 or 18 countries at one time in the menu. And uh, uh, people loved it. Our diners, it was in West Village. And we had the who's who of New York coming to eat with us. But there were certain food critics that were absent. And I wondered that they were always obsessed with what I did. Why aren't they visiting now? And I then got an email from one that I'll keep them anonymous because they're not well enough to defend themselves. And that uh, food critic said to me, uh, don't you think you're being too daring that you're cooking something other than Indian? And I asked, do you ask this question to all the uh, uh, American chefs born and brought up in America who are cooking French and Italian and Vietnamese and Mexican and Indian? Do you question them about the cuisine they're cooking? And this critic uh, replied to me, I never thought of it like that. But, you know, you are Indian. You should cook Indian. I said, why would I have to be ghettoized into a box of what I should do because of my uh, nationality? And they were silent. And then they called me and they said they were so ashamed of themselves. And, you know, that to me is another uh, 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 interlude I had with unconscious bias. And here it was affecting me professionally in a negative manner with a restaurant where I'd given my heart and soul. And anybody who came and ate there said, oh, my God, this is perhaps the greatest place we've ever eaten at. And the critics were a little lukewarm because they were shocked that I was not cooking Indian. 
That's interesting because there again, there are a couple of things here. One is, is the phrase that you mentioned, which is get guys into a box and expectations of you to have only a certain cuisine. And the other, of course, is what a lot of people are talking about these days, which is about cultural appropriation. And, and um, whether it's cooking or whether it's a book that is being written by somebody or a movie, a lot of people are commenting on questioning whether somebody who is not Indian can cook Indian food, as an example, or, or somebody who is not Irish can write a book about Ireland. Uh, uh, could be another example. So the point I'm making is, how do we try and share our own culture plus share our own expertise of cooking in your regard without actually understanding what the world has to offer to us? And yet, because you were Indian, you are Indian, uh, uh, and they, they made assumptions about you, uh, that you, if you're making, if you're having a restaurant, it's got to be of Indian food. I wish I'd eaten at your restaurant, New York, Savir. Uh, but I have in Gurgaon, and, and if that's got anything to go by, I know it must have been absolutely amazing in New York as well. But Thank yes, you. Uh, yeah. So, so some more stories but, uh, because I'm loving and I'll loving tell you, you're sharing. The food critic then came, reviewed my restaurant, created a new word, and I'm forgetting the word that what she uh, created. And the review then called my restaurant a picnic of the flavors of the world. And they couldn't have been more laudatory and, you know, just uh, positive. And then they came and said to me, oh, my God, I was judging your restaurant and your menu without coming and tasting and seeing what you were really up to. And now that I've seen it, my eyes are open. And I think that's the other thing that, you know, as we live mindfully and with uh, eyes wide open and ears listening, we, uh, we sometimes uh, often will learn about our unconscious biases and grow out of them or at least know about them and then work on them. So that was the happy ending there. But um, then as I uh, came to India at age 47 to set up home in New Delhi, I realized that there were two factors where I was being judged on. One was being a single man who, who was at 47 a uh, successful man to a lot of people here. But why was I single? Was there something wrong with me? And then I would say, what do you mean something wrong with me? And so for, to them, if you're single, there's something wrong with you. Or if you don't have uh, a wife and children, then I would say, gay. Oh, oh, that explains. And I said, what, what does it explain? That you've lived away so many years. I said, I didn't live away because I was gay. But the other thing that, would ha that happens in India since I've come back, um, I'm now being treated as a foreigner again in my own land because the Hindi I speak doesn't uh, exist in the colloquial Hindi of today. The uh, songs that I uh, remember are outdated and not memorable enough to the young generation. The uh, idioms I use are archaic. The uh, sensibilities that I have on my clothing are foreign. The, uh, uh, you know, so the books and the uh, everything about me is different. And here I am back in my own land, opening a restaurant here, another one. And I'm again an outsider. And I realize that people are uh, judging me uh, based not on my reality, but on uh, uh, unconscious bias or preconceived ideas about who I might be. And it's very interesting that at 47, I'm living the life I lived in New York in 1993 when I was 20. So I'm feeling that finding the same issues being repeated at the age of 47, 27 years later in my own uh, motherland as I had to face in the foreign land where I set up home at 20. That's actually very strong and, and quite moving, Savir. And, and uh, I'm just trying to, to, to try and, you know, rationalize it in my own head. Because to me, what you're saying is so much about, about our identity and about how we feel about ourselves and are comfortable in our own skin. So on one hand, you know, I think in some strange way, it kind of connects to right from the beginning. You're going to Bombay, to JG School of Art. And what happened there? And then you're going to New York with that backpack on your back that made you see the world in a way that you shouldn't have in hindsight and then you're growing into New York and finding yourself and finding your identity and then of course you come back to Delhi it's 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 20 years later it's 28 years 27 years later um, and how that world has changed it, it, this whole idea of unconscious bias is so much about 
how we see ourselves, what is our identity, and how do we see ourselves. And based on that, people then see us too. And, and we can have multiple identities. We don't have to be just Delhiite or an Indian or a, a, a Londoner, which is what I am a Londoner, and I'm also an Indian. Um, mm -hmm. And to me, both are extremely important. So to me, there are, there are so many layers here, and it's very moving that you've been able to see these different layers because whether it's your color of your skin or whether it's uh, the clothes that you're wearing right now or whether it might have been your sexuality, uh, that the expectations of the society that you live in, which is now Delhi, uh, that's really so much about their unconscious biases and what they expect of you. And uh, Smith, it also it's odd that whenever I would arrive in Delhi for just a quick visit, two week visit, the minute the flight from Delhi to uh, left to go back home to New York was the moment that I started loving and missing uh, uh, Delhi. But when I when the flight from New York left for Delhi, I missed New York and hated Delhi. So when I was in Delhi, I would hate Delhi, but I would love Delhi when I was in New York. And I would uh, question New York when I was there and love it when I was in New Delhi. So in my head, I've always been the outsider no matter where I am. And I always say I'm at home wherever I put my head any given night. Because home to me is where I put my head to rest. Uh, the metaphorical home doesn't exist in my world. I'm like in Hindi, the phrase, the washerman's dog doesn't know whether it belongs to the, uh, you know, where the laundry is or where the home is where they go to rest at night. And that's my story, that I uh, belong in wherever I am, I'm not. I'm in the other place where I want to be. And but I think, again, that's uh, that's unconscious bias playing into my own, uh, uh, psych uh, you know, my own psyche there that I never feel I belong where I am. I always am more comfortable in the uh, uh, in my mindscape and the cities where it's romancing being <laughs> home is where the mind is, not where the heart and the body is. Right. No, I, I, I like that. And of course, you're so right, because it is so much about you know, and it's probably a conscious uh, I, you know, acknowledgement rather than an unconscious bias that that you feel the outsider. And therefore, it is really about where you, you where you put your head down when you go to sleep. Uh, and I think that's that's important because you've said it to yourself and therefore you can be comfortable in that environment, wherever that might be, whether it's Delhi or New York or anywhere else. But but, but tell us a little bit more about New York, uh, uh, Suvir, and your experiences there. I mean, you haven't lived there now for what? Eight, seven, eight years. Is that correct? Yes. Uh, for no, for two years. But oh, okay. uh, uh, I must tell you that when I arrived in New York, I was taken by a very dear friend to uh, Atlanta where he was opening a restaurant and I was going to be his uh, marketing uh, director. And we showed up in uh, uh, Atlanta and we were being wined and dined by the who's who of Atlanta. And at one dinner, we were with the governor's wife and some uh, socialites who were very popular in in on vogue and uh, in demand at that moment and uh, la one of the ladies as she uh, made room for me at the table first thing that they said to me was oh uh, you're a very attractive brown man and I was like is that an underhanded compliment or what and it didn't end there and as I started eating and talking and recanting stories uh, that same lady said to me that you're very well spoken for a colored person um, hmm. and <laughs> <laughs> and by the end of the meal, she said to me, you're the, you're the first colored person who I'm so fond of having met. And I was like, oh, God. So this, so this And this is what, has, 25 years ago you're talking about? I was, uh, 25 years ago. And I was all of 22. And I, and I was cringing, but it didn't end. Everywhere I went in New York of 1993, America of 1995, 98, till 99, 2000. It was an America that was very different. And a person who was confident, who was cocky, who was a raconteur of stories and uh, could entertain people, and was a person of color who spoke with an accent, who was proud of his sexuality. I was on their faces, and yet I was something they'd never seen or imagined or thought of. And what came out of their mouths was cringeworthy, and because there was no black or brown lives matter in those days, I had to accept it quietly and smile at it and then carry on and live with the baggage it left in me and wonder that are these civilized people? Are these, uh, uh, it, it was shocking. And then I arrived years later as after having gotten my Michelin star, made it to top chef master on the TV 
and a, a lady, a librarian in a small town in Wisconsin, reaches out to me after watching me on the show and says, Chef Saran, I'm a librarian in this small town Richland Center in Wisconsin, and I saw you and you said that a palate can change, that people can evolve, their taste buds can evolve, and they can learn new flavors and accepting them. And I would love to have you uh, teach me how to be that. And this message arrived at two or three in the morning and I replied instantly because I don't sleep more than three hours a night. And even when I sleep, my phone is on and as messages come, I answer them. And so I answered and she answered back and I answered back. Fast forward three months later, I arrive in her little town and the librarian had promised me a book signing. And I'd said, you know, in book signings in New York and other cities, 100 people show up, you're lucky. She had 700 people in a town hall waiting for me to uh, address them as I arrive into this small town. But as they picked me up at the airport, her husband, uh, uh, now I get to know them and they're an incredibly kind couple. But when he first greeted me, he said, welcome Chef Saran. And then they, I sat in the back of their car at, at the airport. And then he looks back and says, you're the first heathen we've had in our car. And I was like, excuse me, are you talking to me? Or is there somebody that I don't see in this car? I never thought I would be addressed as a heathen. And he had said it so casually. And this is a man who is a man of cloth, a preacher at the Methodist Church. Since then, he's written me a note telling me that messiahs come in, uh, in our lives once in a lifetime. Jesus, Muhammad, Buddha. And he said, you are one of them. You've taught me what I wouldn't have learned otherwise because I was rough on him for the next two and a half hours of that car ride to that small town. And uh, I told the wife as we got out of the car, they were dropping me off. I said, I've been rough with your husband only for him. Uh, yes, I will show up at the event tomorrow morning as planned. Don't worry. But if you tell him that I'm showing up, I will not show up in the end. So you let him have a miserable night all night. Let him know that he's been very uh, 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 shockingly uh, 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 rude and wrong as a person of cloth. And I said, uh, let him have a sleepless night. She didn't tell him. He, I, he was literally trembling when he saw me the next morning. We had an incredible next four days. And since then, years later, now it's been six, seven years, we've become fast friends. But in his mind, the biblical teachings of old America, we were the, the other was always a heathen and all these pejoratives that were cringeworthy. He has evolved. I have accepted him as a friend. And, you know, from our unconscious to our a uh, conscientious effort in healing those first uh, reactions. We've come a long way and become best friends. And so I just wanted to tell you how life wasn't a bed of roses, but if both parties are willing to uh, give the other side a little uh, wiggle room, we can often grow up to become people who are uh, better members of civil society as we uh, get to know each other and understand each other and where we are coming from. That's uh, that's brilliant. I mean, that's so powerful. Uh, I'm I'm lost for words, really, because uh, it's it's there are here there are unconscious biases, not just about a color of skin, but also about religion uh, and the fact that someone who is a, a, a pastor, who is a person of cloth, who has believed and brought up to to believe what he has from the books that he has read, is not has created his own expectations of what the world should look like. And I, it was fantastic that you had the opportunity of a two and a half hour car ride and the self-confidence, uh, which a lot of people wouldn't have had so near. And therefore, I must congratulate you on that to be able to have that open, honest conversation with him and therefore to help him help himself. Because I must... so many times it wouldn't have happened. I must defend him by saying, yeah, I didn't give him the opportunity to have a conversation. It was a soliloquy from me for two and a half hours, <laughs> berating him. And uh, uh, teaching him religion, spirituality, divinity. The, and I, I was, I'm a person who tells people I'm atheist or agnostic, even though I'm deeply religious, because my religion doesn't teach me to either judge or uh, put another person down. Because my religion says live and let live. Religion is a private affair. But when somebody came on my face and called me a heathen in the early 2000s, I was shocked. I, it was a soliloquy from me for two and a half hours, where the poor man, I'm, 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 I should thank my stars, he didn't have a car accident. <laughs> but um, I didn't give him any chance to speak. But then I got a letter three or four months later 
saying that Messiah's coming in a lifetime. You may be one of them for me because you taught me about the importance of having an open mind and knowing that the world is more than just what meets the eye. And there are people of religion who are different from me and yet worship the same one God. And, you know, he had this conversation in his own head and he's gone on to now ordaining gay marriage and he's changed his whole life as a pastor. That's so all moving. Around. That's so moving. I mean, it, 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 you know, just to hear that story and I... and. Uh, yes, absolutely. It is extremely moving. But uh, Suvi, um, so, you know, you've had these experiences, you've managed to to, to self-reflect and, and challenge yourself, you said right in the beginning, on a daily basis, you wake up and you, and you reflect and you decide to take each day as it comes. But not all of us may have the presence of mind to be able to, to do what you do. What kind of advice can you give us on how do we manage our unconscious biases? Because whether it's race or religion or sexuality um, or, or identity or nationality, I mean, all of us have similar but slightly different experiences. What do we do about it? You know, uh, Smith, I wish I knew what people can. I, I, I can't tell people what to do, but I can tell them why, why I do what I do. I always feel that if I am not generous uh, enough in reflecting and meditating upon what has happened, and giving second chances to myself and others. I, it's the golden rule. I look at giving others chances as for, I look at forgiving others. I look at being uh, generous to others because if I'm in their shoes, I want those chances. I want that forgiveness. I want that uh, mercy. I want what I want to give to the others. So because I'm human and I err and I uh, uh, fail more than just uh, uh, sometimes, I want to give others who uh, make mistakes around me the same benefit of the doubt as I expect others to give me when I make an honest mistake. And, and knowing that, I then, when I deal with life in situations and scenarios and employment opportunities, I look at employees not for the resume they bring, but I look at them as a human being whose eyes tell me there's a story there, whose manner tells me that this is a gracious human being, whose skin color or sexual uh, uh, the, the man or a woman, it tells me that I have fewer women in my team. This woman is already an asset. But then when I see their uh, behavior and mannerisms and way of thinking, I then start seeing that this human being has potential. Uh, I was given chances in America without a resume being strong. People looked at me as this exotic creature that spoke with confidence and had a charming smile and they hired me. Then I worked hard and proved myself, but that chance was given to me. So in my world, I give people chances because I often feel if I'm on the other side, wouldn't I want to be given a chance? And so I live that way. And I hope more people can do that because it just it's the golden rule. You, it's the, I think it's the more kinder and generous way to live and be because then it's also for the world is an echo in some ways and it will echo back to you and to your advantage. So generosity of spirit. I mean, in, in, if I were to summarize, yeah, spirit for yourself and when, in how you perceive others. That's great. Thank you. Thank you so very much, Suvir Saran. I have so enjoyed this conversation with you on stories of unconscious bias. Thank you, Smith. And you've taught me a lot. Thank you. I, I wasn't, I was lost to these two words. Now that I know them, my life is going to be richer. Thank you. Thank you for listening to my podcast, Stories of Unconscious Bias. If you enjoyed hearing this episode, do tune in every Saturday for a new interview. And if you could share, leave a review and rating, that would be hugely appreciated. You can find me on Instagram and Twitter, at Smitha Tharoor, and feel free to suggest new guests. Until next week. <laughs>